let's take a look at Vietnam. Um, Vietnam had been conquered by China in the second century BCE and were dominated by China afterwards for almost a thousand years. Finally, in 938 CE, they threw off the yoke of China and became uh, independent and sovereign. Over the following centuries, they still had uh, dust-ups with China here and there. Uh, then in the 19th century, they were attacked by France, first in 1859, and then over a series uh, of other incidents in the 19th century, taking bits and pieces, until finally the whole country was conquered uh, by France by 1885, and it became part of French Indochina. Indochina indicating it's the area between India and China, uh, and it included not only Vietnam, but also the countries of Laos and Cambodia. So from 1885 on, it was a French colony, and the French had a lot of, uh, a lot of plantations there. Uh, then in World War II, the Japanese invaded French Indochina, uh, taking it away from the French, who had uh, um, the free French that were left, uh, had uh, long, long retreated from the area. And then it was uh, uh, occupied by Japan throughout the rest of World War II. And Japan, uh, as, as you'll remember from our World War II discussion, was a very repressive occupier. Things got really rough under Japan. However, the uh, Vietnamese people during that time period continued to resist. Uh, many of them had been resisting the French, and now they really ramped up their efforts to resist the, Jap the Japanese, who were just especially uh, brutal in their occupation. So during World War II, an organization was formed called in Vietnamese the League for the Independence of Vietnam. Uh, and the uh, somewhat long Vietnamese word for that uh, can be shortened to Viet Minh. So that's how we usually refer to this organization in U.S. history. It was a nationalist group. Their goal was to kick out the Japanese and the French and once more be an independent nation. Now, the leader of the Viet Minh was uh, this guy, Ho Chi Minh, who uh, had a very interesting life. He had traveled extensively uh, in the Soviet Union and the U.S., actually, um, and he was a communist. Um, however, at this time, World War II, the U.S. and the Soviet Union are allies, you will recall, so the Red Scare has been set aside uh, for a while to deal with the Nazi Scare. So um, he is opposing the occupying Japanese, he and his Viet, Viet Minh uh, group. Uh, they're doing so by guerrilla warfare, fighting against the Japanese any way they can. And in this, they were backed by the OSS, that is the Office of Strategic Services, which would later become known as the CIA, or Central Intelligence Agency. So they were fighting against the Japanese with, uh, in some cases, U.S. support, U.S. weaponry, in some cases, U.S. training, um, which is the sort of thing that was going on all throughout Asia in all the places that Japan had occupied. Well, when the war was over, in August 1945, as a result of those atomic bombs being dropped and Japan's unconditional surrender. Well, Japanese have unconditionally surrendered to the Allies, so they're not going to be occupying anything now. Uh, in fact, they're being occupied. So things are wide open for the people of Vietnam. And Vietnam declared itself an independent nation once more, in 1945. But there was a problem. The problem was that technically, according to the Allies, Vietnam was a French colony, right? And France was one of the Allies. And when the war was over, much like Britain, 
they wanted their colonies back, those colonies that had been taken by the Axis powers. So France comes rolling back in, rolling and strolling, and hey, great, we've got our plantations back. <clears throat> but the Vietnamese people wanted none of that. Um, and this led to war within a year uh, with France as the Vietnamese people who had been fighting against the Japanese occupiers now are fighting against the, uh, the French occupiers. <clears throat> now, at this time, 1946, the, uh, the communist Chinese offered help to Vietnam. Now, the uh, Chinese Revolution slash Civil War was still ongoing, right? Uh, although Chairman Mao, not yet chairman, but uh, Mao was uh, getting the upper hand. Uh, nonetheless, they offered assistance, and uh, Ho Chi Minh was, uh, was not real keen on the idea of accepting Chinese resistance. He said, quote, The last time the Chinese came, they stayed a thousand years. The French are foreigners. They are weak. Colonialism is dying. The white man is finished in Asia. But if the Chinese stay now, they'll never go. So, in other words, he, he would much rather deal with the French than the Chinese because uh, the French can be outlasted because they're not permanently in Asia. They, they're not uh, planning to uh, stay in Asia, you know, most of them. Uh, Chinese are a different story. So, no, he wants no help from the Chinese. Instead, he appealed to the United States, who had been his ally during the war, who had been his ally and who, of course, stand for freedom and democracy and self-determination and all that other stuff. They turned to the U.S. for help in their struggle for independence. And they received no help from the United States because France is one of the main allies of the United States at this time, um, and really since the beginning of the United States. States, and uh, they were going to side with their their uh, really big, long-standing European ally over that ally's colonies. So then, with uh, China now being the People's Republic of China, that that revolution having been won, uh, Communist China and the Soviet Union are offering help to uh, Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh in their resistance to France. And so now they take it. The United States did not aid Vietnam, but they did aid France, their longstanding ally. In fact, uh, they kept aiding them more and more as the years went by, so that by the end of that war uh, between France and Vietnam, the U.S. was actually paying 80% of the French war effort. Why? Because of the Truman Doctrine. Um, Ho Chi Minh was uh, uh, a member of the Communist Party, and this is, uh, this is an effort to spread communism and take over the world, so it has to be stopped from the perspective of the U.S. government. But in reality, the communism was secondary. It was a nationalist group. But even then, you know, nationalism from colonies is also problematic. So the U.S. is, is paying a big chunk of the, uh, the war debt for France. This war dragged on for more than seven years, uh, and it became sort of like France's version of the Vietnam War, because it was France's version of the Vietnam War, literally, but also figuratively. They got bogged down uh, in a quagmire uh, that never seemed like it was going to end. What should have, what should have been an easy victory, they thought, was uh, just becoming more and more protracted. Finally, uh, finally, 1954, the, uh, the French army uh, had been outfought and outmaneuvered uh, by the French, and they were sort of, uh, they were headquartered at a place called Dinh Binh Phu in northern Vietnam. 
It's a, it's a place that is surrounded by mountains, very high, uh, rugged mountains uh, that are covered with jungle. So the uh, French were headquartered there. They weren't too worried about being attacked by the Vietnamese in this place. They were planning how they're going to make their attack because they knew it was virtually impossible, would be virtually impossible for the Vietnamese even to get to them over those rugged mountains. And even if they did, it would be impossible for them to bring any artillery, you know, cannons and howitzers and stuff like that over those rugged jungle mountains. So, of course, what the Vietnamese did was bring artillery over those rugged jungle mountains. They were a lot more capable, a lot hardier than the French gave them credit for, and really than the French were. So uh, they did what the, uh, what the French army had thought was impossible. And they got up to the tops of those mountains with their artillery, and guess what? They're pointed straight down at the, uh, the French army, and it's like shooting fish in a barrel. And it was a slaughter. It was a huge lopsided victory for Vietnam. Uh, the French army was, was terribly defeated. And the people in France were already getting tired of this, uh, of, their, of their sons and brothers and husbands being killed uh, over in Southeast Asia, of all the money that was being spent and all the pride that was being spent. Uh, and there was just no will, no further will in the French people to continue this. So uh, essentially that battle ended the, the Franco-Vietnamese War, also called the First Indochina War, which indicates there's going to be a second one, and it's not going to be France. So after the French surrendered at Dinh Binh Phu, the French army withdrew from Vietnam. Well, what's going to happen now? Who's going to be in charge? Um, there was a conference to be held at uh, Geneva in which the uh, uh, United Nations essentially was going to, uh, much like they had, uh, much like, uh, well, around yeah, a few years ago, had done with, uh, with Korea, temporarily divided Vietnam into North and South. North is where Ho Chi Minh had the most support. Um, and then in the South, uh, the, actually the, uh, the Eisenhower administration had favored a guy named No Din Ziem, who was uh, uh, anti-colonialist. He was anti-France, but he was also uh, very, very anti-communist. So uh, he winds up being the person that's leading kind of the movement in South Vietnam that is anti-communist. So uh, Ho is in the North and No is in the South. And the idea is this is going to be a temporary division and free elections are going to be held, nationwide free elections. Vietnam is now going to be an independent country uh, and uh, elections will decide whether it's ho or no, basically. Now, the United States was pretty confident that their guy, No Dinh Diem, was going to lose because Ho Chi Minh had support locked up in the north. And even though uh, No had more support in the south, Ho Chi Minh still had support in the south as well. So if there was a free election, the communist guy would win. So therefore, the United States did not want there to be a free election. Uh, they encouraged No, No Dinh Diem, to refuse to participate in the election. Uh, and uh, once that happened, then Ho Chi Minh supporters in the South started resisting No's government uh, that, uh, you know, they believed to be repressive because it wasn't allowing them to have a national vote. So Ho Chi Minh supporters in the South called themselves the National Liberation Front. Uh, and the uh, short version of that in Vietnamese is not Viet Minh, it is Viet Cong. So uh, I think you may be aware the road that we are now traveling down. So by the end of the 1950s, the U.S. State Department uh, 
had engaged in interventions in Iran, Guatemala, and Vietnam. And uh, they, were, they were proud of it. Uh, they thought that all of these things were wonderful victories and big, big successes for, for democracy. Or so it seemed to them at the time. Gee, I wonder how it would seem later. Well, that was foreign policy. And just to sum up what was going on on the home front, this, again, Manichaean struggle between East and West, between the Soviet bloc and the U.S. bloc, uh, is this all or nothing, black and white with no gray struggle in the eyes of many Americans. And because there's this desire to be the exact opposite of the Soviet Union, that means we have to stand uh, for anything that they're against and be against anything that they are for. Um, so programs that seemed a little too much like socialism, programs which would have been very popular and probably uh, successful and, and embraced if they had been enacted in the 1930s by Roosevelt, late 40s and early 50s, all of a sudden, they don't. Uh, Truman's effort, for example, to bring about uh, national health insurance was attacked by the American Medical Association as communist. Uh, his efforts to uh, increase public housing was attacked by the real estate industry as communist. And if we're going to be the opposite of everything that the communists are, well, the, uh, the true Marxist nations were all officially atheists. So to be the opposite of that, uh, to really stand out as the opposite of that, the United States started putting more emphasis on their own religiosity. Um, in fact, you know, that usage of Judeo-Christian uh, starts being uh, done quite a bit. And it was during this period, actually, in the year 1956, under President Eisenhower, that two things were done that uh, you may not have known were done during the Cold War. For example, the Pledge of Allegiance, which had been around since the late 19th century, had two words added to it. One nation under God, indivisible. People who were uh, old enough, maybe someone who is this is 2020, someone who is 70 years old or older, they're going to remember a time when they said the Pledge of Allegiance and under God wasn't part of it, which is ironic, right? When people don't want to include under God and then other people are like, you're violating the tradition of the Pledge of Allegiance. But um, actually the change in tradition was adding that phrase. And the phrase, in God we trust, was added to all paper currency. Now, that was new as far as paper currency. It had been on coins for about a century, but it's put on all the money. And in 1956 is adopted by Congress as the national motto. So we have to be the opposite of everything the communists are. And we have to really underline that in bold, bold ways.